Well, Christmas has come early this year for Australia's unions, with only a few days to go until Jim Chalmers and Anthony Albanese's pet project, the Job Summit, gets underway on Thursday. Remember before the election, though, Anthony Albanese outlined his vision to bring unions and business together. Here he was back in March. We must discover the spirit of consensus that former Labor Prime Minister Bob Hawke used to bring together governments, trade unions, businesses and civil society around their shared aims of growth and job creation. The only problem with that is, leading up to the summit, it's certainly resembling summits of Labor's past. Not Bob Hawke's wage accord, but more like Kevin Rudd's Dud 2020 summit back in 2008. So joining me now is our wonderful Tuesday night panel, columnist with The Australian, Jennifer Oriel, and Executive Director of the Menzies Research Centre, Nick Cater, both of whom have written brilliantly on this topic this very week. Jennifer, Nick, welcome. Can I start with you, Jen, to, to you first? It's obvious the unions are in charge. They are pulling the strings and have done so for two and a half weeks now. Reviews, bigger spending, changes to industrial relations, more wages. Uh, they're looking more like the government than the government. Well, it's interesting, Chris. Before the election, of course, the union said that they would be campaigning uh, for Labor. Uh, and in return, they expected favours in kind. They expected Labor to work for them. Uh, so I think what we're seeing here is a, a big uh, union, you know, conglomerate, a big union uh, push to really drag the political centre in Australia to the left, especially the economic centre. And Labor is doing little at the moment to resist it. I think what we've got to be wary of uh, at this job summit is the unions making extraordinary claims, extraordinary demands, not with the intention uh, to, to actually have those uh, all of them uh, fulfilled, but to drag the political centre to the left. Um, one of the problems we have is that in you know the 1970s and 1980s across the West, unions would uh, impose multi-sector uh, sectoral bargaining, and uh, and then use that to pressure other employers in small business and so yeah. forth to up their wages, which ended up causing a wage price spiral. Um, we don't. I mean, the West recovered from that in a number of ways that aren't available. We don't have those economic levers anymore, like asset sell-offs by governments and so forth. So we're in a very, very different situation, and uh, we've got political problems here as well as, as well as economic ones that the union will potentially cause Australia at large. And Nick, we've seen Tony Burke promising more consultation and unions given a bigger seat at the table. It begs the question: We can't afford any of this. We can't. I mean, Tony Burke's solution to, uh, say, you know, stagnant wages is that they will regulate for higher wages. They'll get the Fair Commission, Fair Work Commission to work to actually tell employers you have to pay more, you know, to end this crime he calls wage theft. Well, of course, we know that you cannot uh, sustainably raise people's wages that way. The only legitimate way to raise wages is through higher productivity. But yes. you can do it any other way. It just drives businesses broke. He's on this cause and he's also on the trail of, of, of the so-called gig economy. He calls it a cancer, would you believe? I don't think it's a cancer. I think most people who either use Uber or drive Uber would say quite the opposite. You know, that and other services are providing great flexibility for people. But this is a cancer to him. So I think in terms of where he's taking Labor back to, I suggest he's taking them back to 1891, Chris, and the, and, and the Shearer's strike, because the Shearer's were a type of gig economy, you know, and, and that, well, you, the Labor movement was founded uh, it, it, to fight those shearers and, and the ones who just wanted to strike their own contracts with, with, the, with, the, with the bosses. That's where we're going to under this government, particularly with Tony Burke. What an irony, what an irony. Now, in the AFR today, even New South Wales Treasurer Matt Keane said the summit is a union power grab, not a vehicle for reform. It's a fair call, Jennifer, isn't it? Yes, I think so. As I was saying, there are political issues here as well as economic ones at play. And the union for years has been saying that if Labor wins the election, it expects payback. And it expects payback in terms of really corrupting uh, private enterprise in Australia, putting pressure on very small businesses to up their wages when their profit margins are very small and they're very vulnerable to external shocks. 
Um, and making small businesses have to compete not only with big multinational monopolies in Australia, but with each other. And so I think we're, we're heading into dangerous territory here for all of those small businesses that create so much wealth for Australia. Uh, if Labor doesn't uh, stop the union push, it will end up as a one-term government because we won't be able to afford it. And those costs will trickle down to consumers. They won't just stay at the employer level because small businesses won't be able to afford that. No, so, well, you know, they, you visit to your uh, family dentist. You and they're the ones your, that employ people. All of these places, restaurants... Yeah, that's right. And they're having to wear extra costs because they operate on much smaller margins. They don't need unions on their back as well. Uh, so I think, you know, we, we have to be very cautious about what Labor's doing and what the union's intentions are, their political and economic intentions for Australia. All right. To West Australia, and according to Australian billionaire Andrew Twiggy Forrest, bankers have valued Fortescue's green energy unit at $29 billion dollars and Twiggy is banking a $1.4 billion dividend. Does it pay to be green, Nick? Or where is most of the profit coming from? Oh, I think this is... A lot of this is speculative investment, Chris. I mean, as you know, Twiggy Forest wants to... Uh, is, is investing heavily in, in green hydrogen, and that, that is one of these technologies that may yield great benefits down the track, but nobody's sure there's a lot of uh, uh, technical problems to overcome, not least of which is it takes a lot of energy to produce green hydrogen. And he, uh, you can do it, and I think if you were going to do it, I think Twiggy should seriously look at nuclear, because a nuclear power plant could fire up, up the green hydrogen, yes. which could then be very useful in manufacturing and, and, and potentially for exports, but it's it's very it's a lot of you know there's a lot of work to be done on on green hydrogen yet. So I wouldn't be putting my savings in it right yet. It's a great speculative sector though, which is why he's being able to have mm. the company valued the way it was. Now, plenty of doom and gloom abounds in terms of the direction of the Australian global economy, interest rates, inflation, forty years high, forty year highs. Curiously, Jen, it hasn't affected retail spending which jumped in July. What's your reading of this? Is this the calm before the storm? I think it's the last hurrah. Uh, there were great sales in July. I took advantage of some myself, much <laughs> to my uh, husband's <laughs> chagrin. Um, but I think there are a couple of things going on here. Um, it could be that there's a lag between interest rate rises and, uh, and you know, the hip pocket concerns of consumers. Yep. Um, it could be the increase in uh, net migration. And it can also be that consumers are anticipating that with higher inflation, prices will be much higher. So they're looking to... Uh, buy things now and um, and basically store them for later when mm. we are under the under the crunch more of um, economic pressure. Uh, but yes, it does seem that um, consumers aren't really um, responding. They might be a little bit of denial, I think. Yeah, I think I well. think you might be right. Uh, but you know Nick, I've only got 30, 35 to 40 seconds, um, but the flood of migrants crossing the English Channel, almost 1300 migrants crossed the channel in 27 boats. It's close to 23,000 this year alone, which has doubled the number from last year. It's become a major problem because the plan, which is based on our own tough border policies, is stuck in legal purgatory, isn't it? It is, and it's not. It's not of not working as as planned. It's always going to be harder, right? Because you're only talking about you know a matter of uh, le way less than 100 kilometres across that channel. It's not like the distances they have to cover here. But if they had stronger border protection, you know, if, if Boris Johnson had been able to put in pla place his plan to send these these migrants to Africa to settle, I think we would have seen a very different result. In the in the end, they go because the economic incentive for the people smugglers is to send them there. Yeah, exactly, Nick Cater. Jennifer Oriel, great to have you on the program. Thank you for that.